let us open our Bibles to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll read verses 14 to 16. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The title for this sermon would be Comfort to the Discouraged. Comfort to the Discouraged. As we have been teaching in all our Bible studies and preaching in our sermons, the book of Hebrews is a transitional book. It's a book which is recording a transition from God's dealing with the Gentiles to God's dealing with the Jews once again in the tribulation. So as we come to the close of the church age, just before the rapture of the church, we see that there is a slight shift in the focus that the Holy Spirit uh, uh, you know, has from the Gentiles to the Jews. Once again, the whole attention of the world is coming back on Jerusalem, on Israel. So there will be a shift. And once the church is raptured, God starts specifically dealing with the Jews once again. So you must understand the, uh, this very important truth before you can really understand the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a transitional book. The very word Hebrews, born again Christians are not Hebrews. We are not Hebrews. We are Gentiles. Hebrews are the children of Abraham. They are those who are, are the descendants of Abraham. Jews. They are Hebrews. The very title tells you that this book is addressed to the Jews. So once you make that clear, then you go ahead and study it and a lot of things that would have been uh, very confusing earlier would fall into place. But we are not really uh, looking purely from a doctrinal point of view in this sermon at the book of Hebrews and this passage that we have just read. We are going to try and draw a spiritual or a devotional application to our lives. But even a spiritual and devotional application should be based on solid doctrinal foundation. That's why I've said in the beginning that the book of Hebrews is written to the Jews and it is uh, documenting a, tra a, a, a transition that is taking place from God's dealing with the Gentiles to God's dealing with the Jews once again in the tribulation. But when you think about it, then you understand that the reason why the writer of the Hebrews is talking so much about the suffering of uh, the saints in the book of Hebrews is because they are in the tribulation and they will suffer in the tribulation. That's why you have those warning passages in the so-called warning passages in the book of Hebrews which says that if you don't do certain things, you could lose your salvation. That's because it is aimed at a believer in the tribulation. But again, like I've said, we are going to draw some spiritual applications from this great doctrinal book aimed at Jews in the tribulation. But in this passage that we have just read, again, the writer is trying to encourage his readers not to succumb under the pressure of suffering that they are going through. In the tribulation, there is going to be terrible suffering. There is going to be persecution of those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Antichrist and the false prophet will persecute them and they would have to lay down their lives for their faith. Not only that, think about it. The, those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ would not take the mark of the beast. And if they don't take the mark of the beast, they cannot buy nor sell. So if they would like to buy food for their families, for their infant babies, their children, they would not be able to do so. So they would have to watch their families starve to death and still resist from taking the mark of the beast. It's going to be a terrible time. Great suffering is coming upon the earth. 
But you see, brethren, suffering is there even today in the church age and in the lives of born-again Christians. A lot of uh, preachers preach and say, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, all your suffering will be over. They are lying. The truth is, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, your flesh becomes your enemy, the world becomes your enemy, the devil becomes your enemy, and your suffering only begins the moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so this message that the writer of Hebrews is giving to the suffering saints in the tribulation would certainly be like a balm to born-again Christians who are going through suffering here in this church age as well. Christians today are weary, they are tired, and many of them are ready to give up on their faith on account of the sufferings that they are going through in their lives. Now, they are not sure anymore, some of them, whether what they have believed in is really true or not. Some of them are not sure anymore of anything in their lives. And it's very sad. But this is especially true of their faith. They are not sure anymore. I've, I keep hearing this from many, many people. They say, Pastor, I'm not sure anymore if all that I have learned and all that I have believed is true. And you see, the reason why they come to that point and the reason why they become bitter in their lives is because of the terrible sufferings that they go through in this life as born-again Christians. They have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. They have trusted Him with their very souls. But sadly, when it comes to suffering, they fail to trust Jesus Christ with their problems. And this is what is happening among Christians today. They, they could trust Christ with their souls, but they don't want to trust Him with their problems, with their suffering. And because of that, they suffer even more. And that's why I said they're not sure anymore of what they have believed. They're not sure anymore if, uh, you know, their faith is true or not. And that's the condition some Christians are in today. They seem to be praying, but they also see that their prayers are not working. Their prayers are not easing, uh, yielding results. No fruit, no answer to prayers. That discourages them even more. Nothing seems to be going right in their lives. Now they face intense pressure in taking care of their families. They, especially the men, but even women nowadays, they work. And they do that so that they could provide for the needs of their families. So they are already under intense pressure to work and make money and take care of their families. And then there are financial problems. In spite of all the hard work that you put in, you still see that sometimes there are financial troubles in your life. And because of this, a lot of Christians run to these uh, prosperity gospel preachers who promised them that God is going to make them rich and take away all their financial troubles. They go trust those people and they go deeper into their problems. And that's how it is with Christians today. It's very sad. The, most of these Christians who go to these uh, prosperity gospel healers go there because of the problems they are facing in their lives. They want to be rid of those problems. They don't want to have those debts anymore. They want to be uh, rid of all the debts. They want to be debt free. And they think if they go to these preachers, somehow God is going to work a miracle in their lives and get rid of all their financial troubles. And then there are health problems, especially in these days when we have been uh, brainwashed into thinking that bad food is good food and good food is bad food. Health of so many Christians is deteriorating. Once again, what do they do? They run to the faith healers thinking they have some supernatural powers and they can uh, say some sort of a mantra over them and they would be healed. So they rush to these uh, healing meetings only to be disappointed, only to come back dejected, seeing that they were deceived. That's what's happening among most Christians today. They have health problems and that intensifies the suffering that they are going through. Some of them even have relational problems, especially in these last days when education has played a great part in destroying uh, a biblical culture among Christians. There are a lot of relational problems 
between husband and wives, between parents and children, all sorts of relational problems exist today and you have to deal with these things. So you can imagine how much of pressure you are under sometimes because of all these things that happen in your life. And the result is the devil uses all these things to take you to the edge of depression, if not fully into depression. But of course, sometimes there are born again Christians who go completely into depression. They even become bitter against God. They become bitter with their family members. They become bitter inside with themselves. And the devil keeps them in that discouragement, in that defeated condition. The devil loves to see Christians suffer in that way. He leads them through that valley of disappointment discouragement, dejection and th that's why sometimes you read and are shocked of course when you read that some born-again Christian had committed suicide. It's very very sad. You can imagine the, the amount of pressure that the world is laying upon that Christian and how weak he is spiritually to cope with that pressure. And how weak he is to fight the wiles of the devil. And how weak he is spiritually. It's very sad. Now this passage that we have just read gives us great encouragement. If you are going through such suffering. Now remember this. As a born again Christian you will have suffering in this life. There is no way we can escape suffering. God loves suffering in our lives in one way or the other. I do not know how you will suffer. I do not know how everybody else will suffer, but every born again Christian will suffer in this life. Without suffering, there is no perfecting us. God uses suffering to perfect us, to mature us, to draw us closer to Him. There are so many reasons why God allows us to go through suffering, but that the born again Christian will go through suffering, it's very clear in the Bible. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's so clearly there in the Bible and uh, Christians believe these false teachers and preachers who say, if you believe in Jesus Christ, all your sufferings would end. Paul is saying it's been given to you not only to believe in Jesus Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. It's been appointed. Suffering has been appointed for you and me. We will go through suffering. If you are ignorant of this fact, you will be greatly consternated when suffering comes. And that will weaken your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will start complaining and murmuring and you will start doubting Jesus Christ and his love for you. That's why be very careful, Christian. You need to know what to expect in this life. You can certainly expect suffering in this life. I'm just showing you one aspect of your Christian life. Yes, there will be joy. Yes, there will be blessings, all sorts of things. But suffering is a part of all those things. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 16 and 19. Now in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 16, this is the third time in the Bible you find the word Christian mentioned and the word Christian is associated with suffering. Look at this. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You see the very word Christian is associated with suffering. And how did these millions of Christians go wrong? Into thinking that once you become a born again Christian, God will take away all your suffering. What makes you think that you have been called to enjoy your best life here in this earth today? No, brethren, no, not at all. We have been reserved for heaven just as our inheritance is reserved in heaven for us. We are heavenly people. We are seated with Christ today in the heavenly places, the Bible says. In this world you will have tribulation, Jesus said, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Look at uh, verse uh, 19 of First Peter chapter 4. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Suffering according to the will of God. Why haven't Christians 
read these words? Why haven't they understood these words? That a Christian has to suffer in this life and God's will could be for you to suffer. Because it's been given to you not only to believe on Jesus, but also to suffer for his sake. And this is, is for certain in the Christian's life. So you now know what to expect. Don't think you'll have a trouble-free life. Don't think you'll have a suffering-free life. Suffering will come in one form or the other. Because you see, the enemies that you have surround you. And your own flesh is your enemy. Therefore, there will be suffering. The Bible says, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Suffering gives us the strength we need to overcome sin and have victory over sin. God uses suffering for a variety of uh, reasons. All for our benefit. So never, trust, uh, ne never doubt God's love when you go through suffering. And God also gives us again in the midst of suffering great encouragement, strength, joy, peace, everything that we need to endure that suffering. And that's what this passage that we have read in Hebrews chapter 4 is offering to us as Christians. It is offering encouragement to those who are discouraged in this life. And it does so on two fronts. Look at those verses once again. In verse 14 and in verse 16, the Bible gives us two solutions to this great problem of discouragement and dis disappointment in the Christian life. What are these two solutions? In verse 14, that we need uh, to firstly understand is to hold fast our profession. Let's read that. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. You say, what kind of a solution is that? We will look at that. But that's the first part of the solution, holding fast to our profession. But the second one is in verse 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the second part of the solution that we need to come boldly to the throne of grace. Now keep these two things uh, very clear in your mind. Holding fast to our profession, coming boldly to the throne of grace. These are two parts of the solution that God has designed in order to comfort you and strengthen you in the midst of all your sufferings. And we are going to look at how uh, these things are so. Now there are those who choose one part of the solution to the exclusion of the others. One may say, okay, the most important thing is to hold fast our profession. There are others who say, well, the most important thing is to come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, I'm going to show you that that is wrong, that you cannot take either one and leave the other one out. And I'm going to show you how important it is to have both these parts of the solution in order for you to find encouragement and strength in the midst of suffering and trials in your life. Now, there are those who say that the most important thing is to hold fast our profession. What does this mean? It is to make sure you know what you believe and hold fast to it. Believe it with all your heart. It is to do with learning and believing sound doctrine. Orthodoxy is all that we need, they say. We need to be orthodox. We need to be conservative in our theology, in our doctrine. And once you are orthodox and conservative, that's all matters. Nothing else is necessary. Hold on tightly to it. Hold fast to your profession, they say. What is most important is to know your doctrines, is what these people say. The other things are not important. So they are emphasizing the intellectual part of Christianity. Learning, knowing the truths of the scriptures. And so they say this is the most important thing, the fundamental doctrines of the faith, and we need to be sound in doctrine, they say. But these same people who lay an overemphasis on the fundamentals of the faith, on the doctrines, on theology, on learning, on the intellect, are dead in their faith. Look at all the so-called orthodox churches. I'm not talking about the Greek orthodox church. I'm just saying, 
Look at all the orthodox old traditional churches in the world. They are all dead in their faith. Though they claim to hold on to all the correct doctrines and to the correct theology in the Bible. They have the right doctrine but they are dead in their faith. What is the reason for that? They are holding fast to their profession to the negligence of the other part of the solution. But then, I want you to understand this. It is absolutely necessary to hold fast to our profession. It is absolutely necessary to learn the fundamentals of the faith, to learn sound doctrine, learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. It is absolutely important for us to spend time and uh, you know, learn what God wants us to learn from the scripture and then hold fast to your doctrine. Be orthodox. There's nothing wrong in that. But not to the exclusion of the other part as we're going to look at. Because the other side, the other part of the solution is also a necessity just as this first part. But then there is the other extreme. The other extreme is to overemphasize the practical side of Christianity. You see, Christianity is not just believing certain things, but it is living according to what we believe. But there is another group of people who exclude the first part of uh, you know, this solution. They say, holding fast to our profession is not important. What is important is how we live, how we practice our Christian faith. But you see, there is a very basic problem there. The problem is, how do you know how to live if you do not know what you believed in? Unless you know doctrine, you cannot live the life God wants you to live. So these two people are two extremes and you need to be careful about that. Now these people who emphasize the practical side of Christianity sometimes are very prayerful. Right? And they lay a lot of emphasis on prayer. They say, oh come on, let's pray. Let's fast and pray. Let's have all night prayer. Let us uh, do a group prayer. Let us do all forms of prayers. They overemphasize the practical side while neglecting that intellectual side of Christianity as well. God wants you to learn. God wants you to learn sound doctrine. He wants you to rightly divide the word of truth so that, your, that, so, so that that may translate into behavior in your life. That it may translate into correct conduct in your life. Hold fast to the profession and then come boldly to the throne of grace. Both are important. Know what you have believed and live according to that. Otherwise, we become hypocrites. You can either be dead, you know, you just know all the right doctrines, but you're dead in your faith because you don't practice what you believe. Or you practice what you think is right without learning what God wants you to learn. These are the two extremes among Christians today. So they lay an overemphasis on prayer to the exclusion of thought and the need to rightly divide the word of truth and learn doctrine. So what happens? It leaves them again open to deception. It leaves them open to, uh, uh, to error in their conduct. Why do you see so many Christians uh, behaving strangely? They have strange practices, very strange practices. The reason for that is because they don't know what the truth is. Recently, I saw a pastor. I saw a pastor washing the feet of his church members and I was quite taken aback seeing because I uh, thought this guy was quite sound in his doctrine but he's going and washing the feet of his church members I thought about it why would he do that maybe he's thinking that doing that would uh, make him humble before the Lord Jesus Christ or before people you see, the intention may be good, the motive may be good. Look at the overemphasis on the practical side. Of course, the justification would be Jesus himself washed the feet of his disciples. So he said, you know, learn from me and do likewise. So I'm washing the feet. You see how foolish that is? Jesus washing the feet of his disciples would be humility. But you and I washing the feet of church members would be foolishness. It's not at all something that says that you are humble. You could be doing it out of hypocrisy. You could be doing it for so many reasons, false reasons. But you see, the problem is when you don't know 
sound doctrine, it will show in your conduct. It will show in your practices. Strange practices in churches all over the world, especially here in India. In some churches here in India, in those church buildings, you know, when I say churches, I'm talking about really church buildings. Oh, these pious Christians come, they take off their shoes, their slippers, they leave them outside the door and then they come in. And, they, and in some of these uh, congregations, they don't even want to sit on chairs or pews. Because you see, oh, God is here, it's holy, I need to sit down on the floor. I can't wear shoes because God said to Moses, take off your shoes, the ground where you're standing is holy ground. You see that the practical side, the practical side is they're thinking they're being very humble. But it's a false humility because they don't even see that the church building is not the church. It's a place where Christians gather, that's all. Even if you gather in a garden or anywhere else, when two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, he's there in the midst of them. The building is nothing, absolutely nothing. But they think it's just as the Old Testament temple. You have to be very careful because everything here is holy. The, you know, in the other day, I, some months back actually, when the lockdown had not yet started, somebody called me and said, Pastor, I want to send some flowers over. And I want you to keep those flowers in the church hall. I said, why? I thought maybe that person wanted to decorate the church hall and make it look nice. So then I said, why do you want me to keep the flowers here? Oh, the only reason I want to keep the flowers there is because it, I want it to be my offering to God. I want the flowers to be in the presence of God throughout the week. In order to shock her a little bit, I said, what makes you think God's presence is there in this room throughout the week? Once we Christians leave from this place, the devils take over, I said. And she was very shocked. Well, I just meant it as a joke, but I wanted her to see that the building is nothing. Where did she learn that God's presence is there and keeping flowers would be like an offering to God? Wrong belief translating into wrong behavior. See, both extremes are dangerous. Hold fast to your profession, the apostle says, and come boldly to the throne of grace. Both should be there. The intellectual side and the practical side of Christianity are both important. When I say intellectual side, I'm not talking about learning philosophy and science and all these things. No, I'm talking about learning the scriptures. Because you need to use your mind in learning the scriptures. That's why. So don't get me wrong. I never advocate the learning of philosophy or science or any of these things unless, of course, it is to do with, uh, uh, with understanding the scriptures in some way. But be careful about that. So both of these are important, the intellectual side and the practical side of Christianity. They should go together. They are inseparable in the Bible. How is it that Christians separate them? God has given both these things as a solution to the problem of discouragement in the Christian's life. And you must be very careful to notice this. A right profession coupled with a right practice is the key to enjoying the fullness of the Christian life that God intends his people to enjoy. Zeal without knowledge is dangerous and knowledge without zeal is also dangerous. We need to avoid both extremes. There must be knowledge and there must be zeal. Both work together. They are inseparable. And when you have both of these things, there will be great encouragement in your life in the midst of sufferings and troubles that you are going through. I understand that some of you Christians are in such a horrible, miserable condition right now. You think nobody is going to be able to lift you up out of this horrible condition. Remember this, God wants you to be out of that condition right now. He doesn't want you to be like that. He wants you to be encouraged and strengthened. He wants you to get up and walk, keep walking. And he shows you how to do that. Now, there is something else that needs to be emphasized before I actually get into those verses. It is this, that not only is it important to have both the elements of the Christian life present in our lives, but it's also important to have them in the right order. Again, if you don't have this in the right order, there'll be trouble in your life. I'm not talking about suffering, but 
you'll get all messed up spiritually. The order is important just as the apostle presents it. Hold fast to your profession. Learn the Bible first. Know what you believe in and really hold on very strongly as the Holy Spirit gives you conviction about those doctrines. Hold them on very strongly. Never compromise. Then comes the practical side. Not the other way around. The greatest problem with charismatic Christians is this. They have certain experiences and because of those experiences, they formulate doctrines. Isn't that really astounding to think about how stupid can somebody be? Your experience cannot be validated except, you know, you saying that you have experienced something. You say, my experience was that I have seen Jesus Christ. How can you prove it? You cannot. So based on the, the Christian's experience, they formulate doctrines and lead millions astray from the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the scriptures. That's why it's important not only to have both the elements of this uh, 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 of the solution but it's also important to have both the elements in the right order hold fast your profession then you come boldly to the throne of grace learn what God wants you to learn from the scriptures then you put it into practice not the other way around don't try to make scriptures conform to your experience don't try to change the scripture so that it would teach what you believe is right never do that Never ever mess with this book. Remember the warnings given in the Bible about those who mess with that book. Be very careful what you do with the Holy Scriptures. So first the profession of faith and then comes the practice of prayer. It should be in this order. And then you will see that you will be given uh, not only strength to cope with the sufferings that you are going through. But there will be joy and there will be peace in your heart. And you will uh, be able to rejoice even in the midst of sufferings. And that's God's intention for you. Now these two things, working in this order and working together, bring great comfort in the Christian's life. So it's a, uh, it'll help the Christian live a life of fruitfulness and productivity in the midst of suffering. You don't have to uh, give up everything just because you are going through some sort of trouble some sort of suffering you don't have to say now i cannot do anything i'm just going to go and sit in a corner in a dark room and not do anything no that's not what god wants you to do when you have these two things in the right order working in your life working together they will strengthen you encourage you lift you up and help you to produce a life of fruitfulness and contentment that bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let, us con so let us consider these two elements as part of a solution that God has given to those who are discouraged in their Christian lives. The apostle presented it to the Hebrew believers, but the same can be applied spiritually to us Christians. And uh, if you are discouraged and dejected in this life, this sermon, I believe and pray, would be a blessing to you. Consider with me what God wants you to know and understand about this great solution that he has for your problem. Look at, let us go back again to Hebrews chapter 4 and let us begin with verse 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So here we have the first part. Let us hold fast our profession, the apostle says. Now the question is, what does it mean to hold fast to our profession? We hold fast to what we have believed in, in the sense that we do not waver, when it comes uh, to believing those doctrines, we do not doubt, nor uh, you know, do we compromise when it comes to these very important fundamental doctrines of the scriptures. Take for example, the doctrine of the preservation of the scriptures. The doctrine of the preservation of the scriptures. The question is, did God preserve his words that he had given 
to the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament? Did he preserve all these words perfectly without having lost a single word? Now my conviction and what I have learned not only from the scriptures but from uh, a study of various disciplines of manuscript evidence for example has brought me into the conviction that God has preserved every single word that he has ever spoken to mankind. He has preserved them in a book. Now I go ahead and say with other Bible believing preachers and teachers that God has preserved his words in every generation in the universal language of those days. And the universal language of these last days is English. So God has preserved his words in the authorized version, the King James Bible. Now, this is not the place for me to prove why I believe this, but I'm just giving you an example. This is something that I have learned. And by God's grace, I would like to hold fast to this profession, not doubt it, never waver about it, and most importantly, never compromise on this. You know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. If that is true, if some of God's words have been lost in translation, how will man live? Because Jesus said, man shall live by every word, not by some words, not by a few words, not by some important words, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If all those words have not been preserved in this book, then I cannot live. God is not somebody who will go back on his word. In Psalm 12, he has clearly said that he's going to preserve his words from this generation forevermore. I simply trust him. And of course, I have studied in order to find evidence uh, to this fact that the King James Bible indeed is that book in which God has preserved all his words. Of course, I was not born a King James Bible believer. There was a time when I was searching for the truth and when I researched, that's when I understood this great truth. All right. So I'm giving you an example. I hold fast to this profession. He says, hold fast to the profession. That's what it means. You're convicted. You're brought into great conviction by the Holy Spirit that this uh, doctrine is the truth. Unless, of course, other scriptures are shown to you which disprove what you believe then you must be able to or you must be ready to uh, learn what extra things or new things that God is teaching you till then you hold on to that which you have believed in the scriptures or let's take another example you believe strongly with all your heart that uh, you know Jesus Christ loves you hold fast to it the devil will try to put a doubt in your mind. You say, no, I'm convinced, I'm convicted of this great truth. God loves me. He loves me with an unconditional love. Hold on to your profession because of what is written in the scriptures. We hold it fast in the sense that we do not waver in doubt and unbelief. You see, we have already trusted Jesus Christ for our salvation. We can trust him for other things as well. He is trustworthy. So holding fast to our profession means to hold fast our profession of faith mainly after we, uh, you know, this book, holding uh, fast the profession of faith in this book. The next most important thing for you to consider is to hold fast your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who is mentioned and found in this book. Hold fast your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to continue to trust Jesus Christ at all times. And that's important. And in this passage that we are reading, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about trusting him. It's about never doubting for one moment that he cares for you. You have trusted him for salvation. Trust him and have faith in him now in the midst of all your troubles. You need to hold fast to this profession that you uh, have made, that you believe in Jesus Christ. You continue to believe in Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 19. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. The apostle is saying there are some who do not hold 
the head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a part of the body of Christ. So you need to be attached to the head. That's where you receive nourishment from for, you, for yourself, for the, for, you know, for the whole body. That's why you need to hold fast to the head. You need to hold fast to the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him at all times. Never for a moment doubt. Jesus Christ or his love or his compassion, his care for you. You have trusted that he died for your sins. He was buried and he rose up again. You believe that he did all that for you. Now you continue to trust him irrespective of the situation that you are in. So what it means to hold fast to our profession is to hold fast to that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle gives us the reason why we should trust Jesus Christ. The apostle gives us the reason why we should hold fast to this profession of faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it? What makes him worthy of our faith? In this passage, in the very beginning, in verse 14, uh, the apostle begins like this. He says, seeing then that we have a great high priest. My question to, is, to you is, have you seen? Have you seen that we have a great high priest? What is your estimation of the Lord Jesus Christ? A lot of times Christians bring down Jesus Christ to their own level and make it look like he's no better than them. He's not as trustworthy as uh, the Bible says he is. That's because they look at him uh, from a human perspective and not through what the scriptures say about him. They cannot trust him at all times. They think probably he won't help me in this situation. Why would he want to do something like this for me? You know, they, they just don't understand who he is. Have you seen that our high priest is not any ordinary high priest? He's not just any other human uh, uh, being. He's not like your best friend. He's not like your father. He's not like your mother. He's not like any of those people who love you the most. He's much higher, much greater. He's the great High priest. Did you consider this great high priest in whom you have trusted for your salvation? He calls him the great high priest. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26, the Bible says he is a great high priest because of this reason. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. That is what makes your high priest the great high priest because he is holy. If it means that he will never do anything wrong. Never ever do anything wrong. You might be wondering why he is not helping you at this point of time. Know one thing for sure. He is never wrong no matter what he does. He is holy. He cannot do wrong. He is harmless. He cannot harm you. He is called harmless. He is undefiled. He's not like the people of this world. He's separate from sinners. He's made higher than the heavens. Right now, the Jesus Christ in, you, in whom you have trusted, you do not know him after the flesh. He's got nothing to do with the earth right now. He's made higher than the heavens. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's in heaven. This is the great high priest in whom you have trusted. He has been elevated to such a great exalted position by the father than any other human being than any other high priest in this world he has been made higher than the heavens itself so great is your high priest so that God says that there is no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved except the name of Jesus Christ the name of Jesus Christ is so great that at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Christian, you need to understand that the, the reason why you need to hold fast to your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is because he is worthy. He is the great high priest. He is not just any other ordinary person. He is not like any other God of any other religion. He is our great high priest. And the apostle goes on and gives us reasons as to why the Lord Jesus Christ has been given such an exalted position. And because of that exalted position, we can certainly trust in him and hold fast to our profession of faith in him. Never doubt him for a moment. 
Why? Because he's such a great high priest. It says in verse 14 that this great high priest is passed into the heavens. This means, this implies that this great high priest, Jesus Christ, who is passed into the heavens, was first here upon the earth. And that's a, a thing that you need to understand. Before he, was, he passed into the heavens, he was here on the earth. He finished the work for which he had come down to the earth in the first place. And this again is something which becomes a part of your, uh, your profession of faith. The most simple doctrine, the most rudimentary and important doctrine of the Christian faith is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at the person of Christ a little later, but firstly, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has passed into heavens. Before that, he, he was here on the earth. And why was he here on the earth? He was here for a specific purpose. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says, When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So before he passed into the heavens and sat on the right hand of God, he purged our sins. Here on the earth. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. The Bible says. Who needeth not daily as those high priests. To offer up sacrifice. First for his own sins. And then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. How did he purge your sins? By offering up himself in your place upon the cross. This is the most important doctrine and you need to get this clear and hold on to it. Hold on to it. That Jesus died for your sins. He shed his blood for your sins. He took your place and your penalty upon the cross. He died, he was buried and he rose up again. And when you trusted in Jesus Christ, he became righteousness in you. He is the righteousness of God in you and you are accepted by God, justified. You need to know this very simple and basic doctrine and hold fast to it that Jesus has done all these things for you. And because Jesus Christ did this, God has highly exalted him and he is called the one who has passed into the heavens. You need to hold fast to your profession of faith in Jesus Christ because of what he has done on the earth for you. But this verse also implies something else. It says he has passed into the heavens and we have read in uh, uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 of Hebrews that he sat on high. Now, now that he is seated on the God as your high priest, your great high priest, what exactly is he doing? Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Romans 8 34, very quickly, says, Who is he that, that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? Doing what? Who also maketh intercession for us. Christian, this is why you need to hold fast your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did he die for your sins and was buried and rose up again and uh, saved your soul by washing you in his precious blood, but he's right now at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, interceding for you. In 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2, the Bible talks about Jesus Christ as your advocate with the Father. No matter what accusation comes against you, he's there as your, as your advocate. No matter what suffering you may be going through, he's there interceding for you. That's why he is worthy of all your faith and all your trust. And you need to hold fast to this profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How is your condition today, Christian? What have you believed in? What have you learned about Jesus Christ from the scriptures? Because be very careful. You, the, the devil can easily misguide you. He can mislead you. And make you to believe in another Jesus than the Jesus of the scriptures. If you're not careful. That's why you need to learn and study the scriptures. What did Jesus say in the gospel of John chapter 5 verse 39? He said, search the scriptures. 
for in them you think you have life, but these are they which testify of me, he said. Search the scriptures. Like the Berians search the scriptures. Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study the scriptures. Search the scriptures. And build up your faith. Your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Know what you believe about Jesus Christ. It's very, very important. And that will help you to be convicted of the truth and hold fast your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord willing, we will continue talking about this uh, great subject in the coming weeks. But I want to stop here for now and ask you a question. The question is, are you saved? Are you born again? If you should die tonight, do you have the assurance that you would be with God in heaven forever and ever? What have you trusted uh, in or in whom have you trusted? Have you trusted your own good works, your own righteousness, your own religion, your education? What have you trusted in to take you to heaven? If you have trusted in any of these things, you, will, uh, you are not saved and you will not go to heaven. You say, I had a great experience. I saw Jesus Christ. Or you say, I had this experience and the Spirit of God came over me. No, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, what makes you believe that you are saved and that you will go to heaven? If really you have trusted in these experiences and all these other things, then you are not saved and you are going to hell when you die. The Bible is very clear that unless you trust Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, who is the righteousness of God, for your salvation, you cannot be saved. You must know and understand that Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for your sins. And you need to trust that, that blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid the price for your sins. He took the penalty for your sins. He was your substitute upon the cross. He died, he was buried and he rose up again. And you must believe in this. You say, well, I've been regular to church. That will not save you. You say, I've been taking uh, this uh, so-called sacraments in my Roman Catholic church. Those will not save you. My priest prayed for me. That will not save you. There is one mediator between God and men, and it is the man Christ Jesus, nobody else. And Jesus died for your sins, not the Pope. Jesus died for your sins, not your priest. Jesus died for your sins, not your pastor, not your parents, not your religion, nothing. Your own righteousness cannot save you. You must trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross. You must believe that he took your punishment. He paid for your sins. He, was, he died. He was buried. And he rose up again on the third day. According to the scriptures. And when you trust him for your salvation. And believe that Jesus did all this for you. You will be saved and you will go to heaven. And this is the most important truth that you need to hold fast. And my prayer is that you would trust Jesus Christ as your Savior.